Well, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Gritty Hour. I'm here with my good friend, Professor Bob Pucci. How are you, Bob? I'm good. good. I heard you recently retired from yes. uh, the professorship. I did, from yeah. uh, SUNY Ulster. I am now uh, Professor Emeritus, I guess that's what they call it. Wow, that, oh, sounds, yeah. that so, sounds fancy. You know, that, and I, what's the fair now in some ways? I don't know. But, oh, yeah. Man. That and 250 will get you on the train. Yeah, yeah something like that. It used to be a token. So how are you enjoying retirement so far? Well, I've been too busy, I think, to enjoy it. And I still have to get into the rhythm of it because, you know, you're so used to working. And uh, according to the Social Security Administration, I've been uh, racking up points since 1974. Right. So uh, <laughs> I guess it's, it's difficult to get out of the rhythm of, of the semesters working. And actually today was uh, Development Day, which is usually the, the day just before the, uh, the first week of classes, which starts on Monday. And, uh, you know, it's one of those obligations. You had to be there. And of course, I wasn't there. And, uh, and so I, I, it's going to be interesting how I feel kind of like, you know, next week when theoretically I'd be in the class. Mm. Well, you just recently retired, right? Like a month ago or something? Yeah, officially uh, August 15th, but I haven't had any obligations since May. I had a couple of, uh, I don't know what it calls, straight students, you know, who had needed things and uh, took care of them uh, mm -hmm. for graduation, for example. But, uh, yeah, but I, I have not seen a piece of email directed towards me specifically in, in quite some time. That's a beautiful thing, too. Yeah, it? I guess so. I do get to keep my email, so, so they, they could they could call. But for I, those of you who have been watching us for a while know uh, you would remember we had Bob on, one of our first guests on this podcast, about 64 years ago or so? 64. Yeah. I think it was last, uh, last May we started or something like that. Uh -huh. And you were one of our first guests, and we talked about communications, which is what you taught, right? Media? Right, right. Media. Yeah. Uh, media studies, journalism, film, uh, public speaking, which everybody had to take and nobody wanted to. I, I was always astonished that there would be students who were, you know, taking the class as they were graduating. Uh, they put it off, and I often said that, uh, you know, they probably cost themselves half a GPA point by waiting, you know, because uh, I always said it, it's not uh, what you know or who you know, it's who knows you know it. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak, how will they know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't make yourself a presence, uh, you're only your average. Did you teach debate too? Uh, I tried to in this uh, advanced public speaking class. It was supposed to be an honors class, mm -hmm. but uh, they really didn't quite get it. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that seems like an art form that's fallen by the wayside too. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, they go right for the gun. <laughs> Bronx, High, Bronx High School of Science, where I, I graduated from, has the uh, nation's leading debate team. So it's still alive somewhere, uh, but uh, not, not out here in uh, Ulster County uh, Community College. Um, and I think part of the problem is uh, it's, it's like a lack of, uh, of information. In terms of what? A lack well, of information in terms of selling the course to the student? Well, no, it's more a lack of an information of having something to say. Right. Say when you, um, I had a class uh, where I, uh, it was called media literacy. And I thought a good thing about media literacy would be to see how plugged in people were, you know. And so I, I gave uh, an old fashioned current events quiz once a week. And uh, when nobody could score more than three out of 10, I stopped. And, uh, you know, the lack of awareness of, of what's going on, you know, they, they couldn't necessarily name the senators from New York State. Oh, it's uh, very state. Uh, uh, to give you a quick preview, uh, somewhere in the, in the near future, we're doing a podcast. I want to discuss with you and a couple of other people in the teaching profession, my impression about the level of education in this country and tying it into the development of the Department of Education back in 1977, it's been declining.
declining ever since. And I think it was declining before that. Well, yeah. You know, I, I think part of the problem was that uh, I, I, would, I would start with uh, English, which was, uh, you know, it's a very basic subject. It's something that everybody has to learn to read and write. And uh, around about the late 1960s, uh, there was uh, people coming out of uh, grad school, going into teaching, who, uh, who didn't want to burden the students with rules like mm -hmm. grammar and spelling. They wanted them to be expressive, you know, and so they, they maybe they assumed the grammar and the spelling, but, but I, I think what happened was that uh, people became further and further away from the very basics that would give them the ability to teach themselves and, and also the, the impulse to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's like somebody else is supposed to be responsible for it, not me. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there was something where uh, uh, someone was talking about someone who was at Columbia, and uh, they overheard them uh, saying something about a quiz, saying that, uh, well, you know, he didn't say that was going to be on the test. And so, therefore, I'm not responsible for not getting it right, mm -hmm. for not knowing it. And, uh, so they want the questions before the test. Well, they 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 want to know. I, I've heard so many times people saying something like, "Just tell me what I need to know," and my response has always been, "I don't know what you need to know. You know, I can tell you different things, but uh, I don't know if you need to know them. You have to decide what you need to know, because that's what's going to stick. You know, everything else is." Uh, in one ear and out the other, you know, it's yeah. sort of like you yeah. take Western Civ and, uh, you know, you, you take the unit test on the Egyptians and then all oh, the Egyptians. Well, what's the core way. problem? Is it, a, is it a teaching problem? Is it a learning problem? Is it somewhere in between? Uh, well, I think on, on the teaching side, uh, people have kind of tried to lower their standards to, uh, to meet what they're getting on the, on the learning side. Uh, you have students who have become very uh, passive, you know, and they don't, uh, they're not motivated to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, one student who was in my journalism class, and uh, he very interestingly said to me once, you know, it's sort of like, you, you only teach things when, when you want to know them. And I said, well, I'd be wasting my time any other time, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. If you don't need to know it, uh -huh. you don't want to know it. I apologize for that. That was my phone. That was your phone. That was, we, we, we did have another gentleman that was supposed to join us, but uh, that's probably him calling. Um, so, yeah, so somewhere in between, you think? It's, yeah, I, I They're think trying so. to meet that middle. The student is getting up to here and the teacher's going right, down to there. Right, right. They're, and they're, they're trying to uh, get them through. Although I always say that, you know, a degree without an education is, is eventually worthless. Mm -hmm. you know, because a degree only gives you, I don't know, the, uh, the license to apply. But, mm -hmm. but whether you have the skills or the knowledge to actually do a particular job, uh, you know, is something that is determined hopefully in a, in a good interview. And uh, maybe you don't get a job as a result. And then you have a degree, but you don't have a job. One of the things you taught, in addition to those communication skills, etc., was uh, movie. What was it? Movie? Yeah. Oh, a film. Yeah, a film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, something called Art of the Film and uh, World Cinema. And uh, and I think that you know it, it was also interesting there because a lot of students would take the class in their last semester. Thinking that we're going to see Spider-Man one, two, and three, or Batman, and, you know, and uh, they got a, a serious course in understanding what they're looking at when they look at a film, and um, and some of them were just like, "Gee, this is harder than it should be." <laughs> and uh, I, but I I made no apologies for it because the people who came out of it, I had one student who went to uh, Tulane in the film program. And uh, he wrote back to me and said that my film course was better than the courses they had there. Wow. So, uh, 
you know, so you studied old, old film predominantly? Uh, yeah, well, I, I sort of incorporated more uh, new films to uh, kind of like keep them interested. And uh, basically, I start out with uh, taking the five components of film and giving an example of film for each. So for structure, I choose the 39 steps. For cinematography on the waterfront. Uh, for mise-en-scene, which covers everything, including actors' movements, Grand Budapest Hotel, and then as an alternate, the graduate, because Grand Budapest Hotel is way over the top, and the graduate is very subtle. Mm -hmm. And so they get to see the same when you say it's more subtle, you mean the director's approach to... Oh, well, everything. You know, the, the scenery is more subtle, mm -hmm. and symbolic. Uh, the acting is more uh, internal and uh, very sort of subtle with the gestures. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice contrast. Uh, but I also, while I'm doing this, I'm also teaching a progression of history of film. And by the time we got to the graduate, we had uh, something called New Hollywood, where all of the old uh, fossils uh, of the uh, producers were checking out. Uh, companies like McGraw Hill were buying uh, movie studios, uh, and uh, and young filmmakers were given a chance to uh, try new things and to also break down the, uh, the code. Uh, system that existed, which uh, inhibited uh, subject matter and what you could depict. And how that the Hayes Code was it called? Yeah, yeah. And that went into when? How long did that? Uh, well, it, it it started in 1934. So movies that were made before 1934, things like Public Enemy, All Quiet on the Western Front, had, for example, a certain liberty that movies that were made between 1934, technically 1970, but by by the mid 60s, the system was breaking down and uh, it was replaced by the famous uh, GPG, PG 13 RX. Uh, Do you know system. the history of the Hayes Code? Oh, yes. I'm just curious, there had to have been one or two films that prompted that code to come into existence. Well, there were, well, there were a couple of scandals that prompted it to come into existence. Um, there was the Fatty Arbuckle uh, scandal. Uh, where he was supposedly uh, you know, uh, raped and, uh, and by raping killed this woman. Uh, and he was put on trial three times and he was acquitted both times, but it ruined his career. Mm -hmm. And it cast this, uh, I don't know, this pall over Hollywood. There was another famous uh, murder of a director uh, who, was, who was gay. And, uh, you know, basically the, uh, uh, it, was, it all sort of fell upon the Catholic Church to uh, suggest that they were going to boycott movies and tell people to boycott films unless something was done about it. So uh, the uh, Hayes office was uh, founded, and the idea being that uh, this uh, office would vet the scripts and vet the final film uh, and take out anything that could be construed as uh, morally objectionable. So there's no one particular movie that I can YouTube right after this podcast? <laughs> no, but you could look at a number of them, uh, you know, uh, May West earlier, May West movies, any of the pre-code movies, which had uh, a number of uh, you know, instances of, uh, of partial nudity, uh, you know, obviously uh, sexual situations, um, and, uh, and also questionable Morals. There was uh, the famous case. I don't know the film, but supposedly a, a man was cheating on his wife, and she kills him. And uh, and after the Hayes Code, she has to forgive him. You know, uh, and the idea of maintaining the family and maintaining, uh, you know, what we might consider a moral standard. Uh, all violence had to be uh, suppressed. Uh, kisses could not last more than a particular amount of time. There were interesting ways in which people tried to get around this. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, for example, in Vertigo, has uh, uh, a couple kiss, and as they kiss, the camera moves around them. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing them kissing, you're seeing the back of one head, then the back of another head, and then they're kissing. So they're kissing for more than five seconds, but they've been kissing the whole time, the camera's been moving. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and it happened one night, uh, Frank Capra did a number of uh, 
of risque things, uh -huh. uh, you know, that were kind of like the, the scene where they're, uh, you know, spending the night together and they're not married and Clark Gable puts up the, the blanket uh, and it was sort of making fun of the whole uh, Hays Code. And uh, there's one scene there where, uh, you know, you can obviously see the outline of Claudette Colbert's uh, breast, um, but, but, you know, it was just like, well, it was just within the boundaries. And of course, W.C. Fields and Mae West in their films, uh, they don't want to talk about it in the work. I mean, so uh, they said things that, uh, you know, the censors did not pick up. They weren't in the script. So the censor was looking at the script and they're looking at the film. What did he say? <laughs> really? Yeah. That's so, yeah. how it happened? Yeah. So they, wow. they would slip things through. So the, the Hays Code, was, was that, the Hays Code, was that still in effect when Marilyn Monroe came around? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Like the seven year itch? And yeah. Uh, officially, it didn't really end until uh, 1970, I think, when they replaced it with the... Uh, There's the a scene system. that sticks in my head. I think it's the seven year itch where mm -hmm. she's sitting in front of an air conditioner. Oh, yeah. Is that the seven year itch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's a little suggestive. Oh, yeah, well, they would try, they would push the envelope as, as much as they could. You know, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, you know, showing who directed the seven there. year itch, do you know? Uh, I forget that. But uh, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, obviously uh, homosexuality was taboo, although in Public Enemy it suggested that the uh, person who grooms Jimmy Cagney and his, and his friend is gay. Um, and then, of course, there's that great line in uh, uh, Bringing a Baby, where uh, Cary Grant is dressed in a, uh, a, a dressing gown and fuzzy slippers. And uh, the woman asks him, what is he doing dressed like that? And he says, I thought I'd just turn gay. You know, and uh, but the gay did the word gay didn't have that connotation, right? Well, it, it, it well people knew what he, what he meant by it, but I guess you know that was something else that you know kind of slipped past the censors. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it may not have been the you know the script is submitted, and uh, the people who were watching these things were kind of like, uh, you know, they were not very interested. It's uh, you know, there's a board now that sits and watches to determine what the rating is. And uh, there's a very famous story about uh, uh, a, a movie that received an R rating for what seems to me to be a very sort of trivial thing. I, I think, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the name of the movie, but uh, in the movie, uh, these, this middle-aged couple uh, finds a joint and they smoke it. And, um, and it's not read for madness. No, it's not read for madness. And it's really just kind of like, you know, leads to them kind of loosening up and having a romantic interlude, which is fine. But, but the censors decided that it was an R rated film because they did not express regret for having smoked it. Mm -hmm. Had they expressed regret, it would have been PG 13, which is the golden standard. You know, you always want your movie to be PG-13. It's a movie for young adults or kids, and uh, it's going to be rated G or PG. They throw in a couple of goddamns and a bloody nose so that it gets PG-13. And uh, PG-13 is you got to be 13 or over? Yeah, parental guidance suggested, uh, you know, 13, you know, you know, kind of like, you know, they can't see the film. I often wonder if you took somebody from, say, 1929 and plop them in a movie theater today, <laughs> what the reaction would be well, to some of today's movies? Well, 1929, that was pre-code, so they probably would not have been uh, as shocked as you might think. Uh, you know, certainly all the language that you might hear in a film today was, uh, you know, part of the argot of the day in the 1920s. Uh, just like you know, the idea that uh, couples always stay together, but well, even pre code, you couldn't curse, right? You didn't, you, you didn't curse, yeah. Well, they didn't curse. I mean, there wasn't you know, cursing in, in a film is really a kind of uh, it's it's a lost leader in, in, in a way because uh, if you use it once, it has great power, if you constantly use it, it loses any value. 
Oh no, I throw it out there all the time. Yeah. Well, well, for example, <laughs> for example, once we were uh, this group was going to put on a play, and we ha we're reading the play, and the characters are two people sort of like caught in some kind of post-apocalyptic apocalyptic situation, and they're they're cursing back and forth, cursing. But the first time we read through, it sounded like, oh yeah, that's really raw. It's really realistic. Second time, all we heard was the curse words, the curse words, the curse words. But we realized that most of them were not necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, and that um, I have a very good example of this. I worked well, almost every office I've worked in. You know, they say like, you know, curse like sailors or, uh, or truck drivers. My father didn't really curse very much. He was a truck driver. But, but you know, there's this whole idea that, you know, there's a certain, uh, I don't know, class or whatever that's going to curse all the time. I did a play called Savage in Limbo, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, kind of like the Bronx alphabet, and this, and that, you know, whatever. But uh, I how worked. How can we? <laughs> yeah, how did you can. But, but uh, I worked in this office, and everybody cursed all the time, except for one person. Uh, her, her name was Anne uh, Redding. And uh, she was very proper. She was dressed very, very well. And she never, ever, ever cursed. One day, she stopped the entire office dead when the printer was not behaving. And she said, damn. See, the word damn? She just said damn, but everyone was like, oh. And Redding said damn. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't curse, and then you curse. That's like, what's his name in the gun with the wind, right? Yeah, right. Right. Frankly, Scarlet, they don't give a damn. They're Clark Gable. Or the, what the hell was it? Clark Gable. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, there was a big uh, discussion about whether they could have that or use it. Uh, you know, they took yeah, I remember that was a big deal. Yeah. Was that post hate code? No, no, no. It was right in the middle of it. But, uh, but you know. I meant post implementation. Oh, yeah. Implement. 1934. So 1939 would have been you know, right in the thick of it. Um, was Chris, that in the book? The word damn? Uh, I can't remember. I think maybe it was, which may have been the way they justified it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was always kind of like, you know, a negotiation, if you will, about, you know, what could be said or how it could be said. Uh, Preston Sturgis, who was a director of films in the uh, 40s, uh, he was always playing with that, uh, kind of like, you know, pushing the envelope, showing things that. You know, he knew it was going to upset someone. Mm -hmm. Like he had uh, black and white prisoners drinking from the same cup in this one scene. Uh, you know, in Sullivan's travels. Uh, he also has Veronica Lake uh, in the shower, and someone comes in uh, to give her, uh, you know, a dress to wear, and she presses the shower curtain against her breast, and you can clearly see her nipple. You know, and uh, so there were different Bob, ways. You said nipple. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what, what's your favorite movie of all time, if you have one, and, and why? Uh, I don't know. That's so hard because, uh, you know, you said my favorite Italian movie, my favorite French movie, you know. But it, it's, it's very difficult, you know. I, I mean, there are movies that, uh, uh, for example, like Casablanca that I can watch all the time. I, you know, somebody put up something about, uh, you know, Key Largo. And, uh, you know, that's another movie. It's got some false moments in it, but it's also got some great moments in it. Uh, Bilago? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know. That's uh, with Fogart and uh, Edward Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. It's Johnny Rocco. Yeah. I used to be big, you know. Yeah. Where's your Moses now? So you... Yeah. Now, well, you know, I always laughed. Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, I think it's in uh, Ben Hur. He's the uh, architect of the Pharaoh. Uh -huh. And uh, so at one point he's got a line. He says, "I'm going to Goshen," and I'm like, "Goshen, New York." <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way he says it, he, his accent. Where is he? Where was he from? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Okay. Brooklyn. Yeah. He was in the Ten Commandments too. Yeah. 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 But you know, where's so, your Moses now? Yeah, the greatest so, character in Mars. Yeah, it's sort of like. Uh, but he was a very educated man. Had a fantastic art collection. Impressionist. My favorite piece of him, I, I can't remember the name of the movie, he, he finds this coat. It's a, like a magical coat. There's like five or six uh, uh, little vignettes, this movie, oh, about the same coat. Charles Law, Law, Lawton, mm -hmm. uh, 
wears it and he becomes a conductor, a uh, composer, conductor, conducts his own opera or whatever. And then he gives it away, and then Edward G. Robinson, he's on the Bowery, on the Skid Row, and uh, he wears the jacket to a reunion of his graduating class of college, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he's very good in that movie, and I, I wish I remembered the name of it during this, but uh, I could put it in the show notes, Bob. Oh, yeah, Post okay. edit, man. Post edit Post magic. Edit and find out, yeah. find out what it was. Yeah. There and I'll put of, the director of uh, okay, Seven Year Rich in there, too. I, I think, you know, there a lot, lot of notes of, in this one. There are a lot of uh, a lot of films that are kind of like, you know, go by and they're underappreciated and then they're sort of picked up later. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Lawton, for example, directed only one movie, Night of the Hunter. Uh, and it's very famous for Bob Mitchum having love and hate tattooed on his fingers. And um, I didn't know he directed that. Yeah, and it was his only film, uh, fantastic cinematography, uh, and uh, great, great acting, Shelley Winters, and uh, just the scenography of it is, is very incredible. And the Cone brothers adore it because they quote from it all the time. Uh, but uh, uh, but when it premiered, it you know barely made a ripple. Uh, you know, Charles Lawton didn't get any other offers. Uh, you know, uh, maybe he was play. over budget. I don't think so. It was a pretty pretty simple movie. Uh, you know, uh, and I was thinking, I was looking at uh, it was like the teaser the, for uh, Key Largo, and uh, you know that was I was looking at all the shots, and one of them was. Uh, you know, kind of like B-roll, public domain shot of uh, kind of like the Florida coast. And then there was, uh, you know, one exterior shot of a building. And then the rest of it was all done inside a studio. And, and at one point, the, the walls, the you know, molding doesn't line up, you know, on the walls. And this is, you know, and it's like, you well, know. Well, that's harder to judge. Like a layman like myself, I can tell someone is a good actor from someone who's a bad actor. But cinematography, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not nuanced enough to know what's good and bad cinematography. Yeah, well, you, know, I, you can cheat and just show like Niagara Falls. Oh, look at the cinematography. But, well, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a, it's a real art. And uh, well, what and, goes into it? I don't understand. Okay, so the difference between good cinematography and bad. Okay, so a good cinematographer is always conscious of, of light, mm -hmm. is always conscious of, uh, of composition, uh, always conscious when of... When you say composition, what does that mean? What is in front of you oh, in okay. the frame. Okay. You know, what's in the frame, what's out of the frame. Like us, we're uh, in the middle of my right, antique store. Here. Right, the, uh, the angle of the shot. Mm -hmm. You know, is it a low angle up? Is it a straight ahead angle? Is it down? Mm -hmm. uh, is the camera moving? Is it is it tracking someone, following someone? Um, and all of these are, are choices that are, are not necessarily, you know, in the shooting script, except in a very sort of general way, you know. And so uh, choosing uh, the setups, because the setup is like, for example, this is a two shot right here. Now, if we were doing a, a film, uh, there would be uh, two other cameras, or there would be separate uh, setups. One just with a, a close-up on me, one with a close-up on you, and then the editor would uh, switch between you listening, you talking, me talking, me listening, and that's the editor's uh, skill. But the cinematographer has got to set up those shots. Uh, so yeah. So what, 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 how much of that is? The cinematographer, and how much of that is the set director for well, the for the for the composition? Well, you, say. you know, it, it depends on the director. Um, somebody like uh, Kubrick uh, shot a lot of his own scenes, you know, and so he was uh, meaning he set the scenes up himself. Yeah, and he shot them with a thirty-five millimeter hour. Oh, he used yeah. the camera. Okay. Yeah, and he no. used the camera. And some some directors use the camera, and others are just like trust to the cinematographer. You know, that's what you do. Uh, but but they usually talk about what kind of effect they want to make, you know. And so if you look at uh, a film, for example, that's set in New York City, and it's a comedy, as opposed to uh, a 
a film set in New York City and it's a drama, uh, you'll see all different kinds of choices of, of angles and composition and even uh, the, the color shift in the film, mm. the color stock, uh, you know. Uh, that co and that's enhanced or de-enhanced in the editing process? Well, no, I mean, they, it's the, the cinematographer chooses the film stock. So, uh, you know, if he chooses a color film uh, that tends to uh, to the blue end of the spectrum and is a little grainy, uh, you know, he's doing it because he wants to get a, a gritty documentary type effect. Uh, and if he's choosing one that has a, more of a red shift uh, and has very bright lighting, we call it high key lighting, uh, with its very little shadows, uh, you know, then he's trying to get this other effect, a comic effect. You know, Central Park can be uh, uh, a playground or it can be medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be uh, barefoot in the park or it could be, uh, you know, the Charles Bronson uh, vigilante. Death movies. Wish. Death yeah. Wish. Yeah. It could be Death Wish. You know? yeah. And it's the same park. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's how it's shot. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But I think nowadays a lot of it is filmed digitally, right? So all of that could be well, you could do it manipulated, or, right? Yeah, it could be. I mean, um, um, before digital, there was something called the process shot, and uh, what that was was there was like a, a blue screen or a green screen behind the actors, and they projected a uh, background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and like we have here, right? Because right. we're actually sitting in a parking lot in uh, City Field, right? Right. <laughs> and, and when we when I did my Zoom classes, I did them from my uh, office at home, and I've got a wall of books behind me, and they, they were asking me, "Is that is that a digital set, or is that that my actual library?" And so you have to turn around and grab a book, pull books off there. <laughs> so no, it's my it's my really library. But but when they did the process shot. Uh, you know, someone would go out and film, for example, you would see this a lot in films when people are driving. You know, the scenery behind them is, is changing and they're talking and not looking at the road. You know, that's a process shot. And uh, I remember that there was one in the early days, you know, they had to get the scale right. And there's a, a shot in, in Tarzan where the, uh, uh, the principals are walking past the natives and the natives are out of scale. They're all about eight feet tall, you know. And uh, and and but they got better and better at this. Although I have to say, if you want to see a really bad example of a process shot, uh, you know, it uh, it takes a thief. The Alfred Hitchcock movie, terrible process shots. Uh, but uh, but the process shot was so perfected by by the end of World War II that uh, a couple of the uh, uh, people in the studio said, we, you know, we'll never have to go on location. Again. And of course, at that point, uh, Italian neorealism uh, came into focus and suddenly they were shooting out on the street with available light and all these process shots looked off and funky. And that's why we get something like On the Waterfront, which is actually filmed, you know, on location, uh, you know, rather than uh, kind of like, you know, Hollywood uh, yeah. with uh, phony backdrops. Yes, yeah, like especially when people are driving. Yeah, the driving was always bad. Although, you know, I, I if you watch A Touch of Evil, Orson Welles, uh, you know, obviously rejected that idea. He had a, a truck with a crane, uh, you know, uh, shooting the actors driving. So they were actually driving? Yeah, they were actually driving. Now that's asking a lot of an actor to drive, operate a motor vehicle and act at the same time. Well, <laughs> chew gum and walk. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's, you know, it's not really, it's not really that bad, except that actually, I think it was probably more difficult to maintain the illusion that you were driving when you were having this scene, uh, you know, with this other actor and you're looking at them you know, the whole time. Yeah, like, well, you know, they have the hand on the wheel. Watch the road. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, right. It, it, it is distracting. Yes. Kind of like, you know, and, and, and sometimes the scenery is like, what are you doing, 130 miles an hour? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so digital effects, you know, have made it uh, cleaner in some ways to do things. Uh, it's uh, avoided a lot of makeup, you know, because you can set up the actors with these little sort of 
pixel points and you can project on them, you know, all kinds of incredible makeup. You know, it's incredible. Uh, I, was, I was looking at uh, the Irishman with De Niro and mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> they actually digitally enhanced him to make him look like 25 years younger than he is or 30 years younger than he is. And, it was, and he does. It, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it was sort of, I didn't really buy that scene where he's, you know, his truck breaks down at the beginning and uh, Joe Pesci comes over and fixes it for him. You know, he just doesn't look like a kid. But, uh, no, I understand what you're saying, but... Uh, but yeah, no, but... He didn't look like current Robert no, De Niro either. Not, no, that, the current Robert De Niro is the Robert De Niro in the last scene. You know? Yeah, yeah. Right, and the and current Joe Pesci is the Joe Pesci in the last scene. It's, it's, it's very, some of it is unsettling, like, uh, you know, I don't particularly have a desire to see Abe Lincoln blinking and smiling mm -hmm. and having his head turn on. I mean, you see those photographs they do? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Um, I mean, you know, I like, I like the color. I like the color of this. That's the big trend now is colorizing the old. Oh, yeah, the colorizing the pictures. And, and, and speed correcting and, and, you know, whatever, digitally enhancing it. And, uh, There's a couple of channels on YouTube that I follow that uh, <clears throat> do nothing but that. Films from like 1880 through 1920. Right. And they, they colorize it and it's surreal. Yeah, colorizing has gotten much better. Um, when uh, the problem started with Ted Turner, you know, for, uh, I think he spent a billion dollars and bought up the entire MGM catalog. And at the time that he did that, MGM had already acquired the catalogs of almost all the other major film companies. So basically, that's what started the VHS revolution, movies on VHS. The blockbuster era. And, and he thought that they, people would like movies better if they were colorized. And uh, so sometimes to, uh, to do this, in terms of the costumes, uh, you know, they would go to the morgue of the studio and they would see the costumes and they would say, okay, so that, that was blue or that was red or whatever. But they didn't realize that the uh, costumers of the period chose a costume by how it would look in black and white. Uh -huh. You know, so, uh, so, you know, if it was brown, uh, you know, it was because it, it had a certain tonality. You know, here's, here's Barry. So in the wild and wicked world of podcasting, the person that was supposed to come finally showed up. Showed up, but we're gonna we're gonna reschedule him and uh, we'll have him back. Uh, I want I don't want to mention his name, okay? Because he's a famous guy. He's like Elvis Presley. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, so you don't have a particular famous film. No, I mean I I was thinking once that I would uh, uh, if I was going to write a book about film. I would write uh, a book called uh, Perfect Films. And uh, these would be, you know, films that I think are so well done and, uh, you know, have so few, if any, flaws uh, that they, you know, occupy a special place, mm -hmm. you know, because of uh, all of the elements are, are so well integrated and uh, all of the acting and the cinematography, the editing, it, you know, just all flows together beautifully. Um, well, you know, you are retired now. I could perhaps. I'll be. even blend you a pen all right. and a notebook. Right. Well, you know, it's a very famous story. It's actually a book that I wouldn't mind reading because yeah. you're obviously very knowledgeable about film. If you wanted to slap one of them together, I'd definitely be interested in purchasing one. Okay. All right. Well, I, I want I, a discount though. I've got You'll get it. I mean, and I want to sign copies so I can read it and put it on eBay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, but you don't have a particular one. How about a top five or a top uh, three? Top five. Well, I, I think uh, I would have to go with uh, uh, The Bicycle Thieves. Um, I'd have to go with uh, something like uh, uh, The Graduate, uh, something like... Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel. I mean, these are all. We're not ending this podcast till you mention it's a wonderful life. Oh, I, I was going to bring up actually okay. before the guest came. I, I saw that in your house, but no, uh, there was a big to do. In fact, 
when the colorized version of that came out to tie into what we were just right, talking about. Right, right, right. I mean, and probably because, again, you know, what they were choosing as colors, you know, probably were, were based on false information because, you know, uh, I don't know if you... Uh, I think if they colored it now with the more modern technology in the digital world, it would probably look better. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, w it would, uh, you know, uh, but it's interesting that when uh, when Martin Scorsese was making uh, uh, the boxing film with uh, Robert De Niro, and, uh, and it was going to, it was going to be all of this blood, you know, in the in the, in the uh, region. Below. Oh yeah, that's a great. And uh, so they they filmed it, and uh, it didn't look right, you know, because they were using the typical uh, stage blood, which is uh, you know Cairo syrup and red dye number two or three or something. like so what did they wind up using? Hershey's chocolate syrup. Really? Which looks a lot better in black and white. And now, you don't want to colorize that. No. Because you don't and, want to see that coming out of your mouth. And then, of course, you know, another interesting example of, of desaturation of color was uh, at the end of Taxi Driver uh, that uh, Scorsese desaturized the movie so that it looks rather you know, artificial, uh, because he thought it was too gory, or that people would think it was too gory. Really? Uh, so, uh, so yeah. That, and that was filmed in color. Uh, that was filmed in color, but he, you know, they desaturated the, the blood. Interesting. Uh, you know, so that what in the, in the hotel room? What? Yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of uh, you know sort of tricks that are done after the fact. Sometimes, sometimes to uh, please an actor. Sometimes to Please, uh, a sensor, uh, for example, to avoid an X rating. Uh, Clockwork Orange started out with an X rating, and uh, they realized that this was going to be uh, you know, inhibitive of being able to show it and people would see it. So, so they basically said, well, what will it take to make it uh, an R rating? And it basically was two or three little edits, mm. uh, you know, that, that brought it just in under. They are, and of course, Midnight Cowboy went up the next rating, uh, primarily because of what it was about, uh, you know, and won the Academy Award. So that was the first uh, X-rated movie. And then I didn't even know it was X-rated. Yeah. So I've watched an X-rated movie, Bob. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, my favorite one was the uh, the, the Catholic Church put out a bullet every week. Yes. A list of films. I don't know if you remember. In the Catholic this. News. The Catholic News. And uh, I, they, I was prevented from seeing a hell of a lot of movies. Well, you know, because <laughs> of that. And there was the A, which was uh, morally acceptable for all. Mm -hmm. And then there was the B list, which was morally objectionable in part mm -hmm. for all. And then the C list was condemned. All the movies I went to see were on that list. Yeah. Any of my childhood friends that might watch this podcast will smile and remember a big to do I had when the movie Tommy came out. But uh, I won't get into that. But uh, when you were talking about editing Clockwork Orange, I was thinking of another movie, Caligula. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen the director's cut or the uncut version of that? No, I haven't. That's a pornographic movie. Oh, it is. Yeah. And in fact, it's very interesting. I had a student once, and uh, we were talking about how uh, uh, the internet was uh, closing down video stores. And she said, well, the, the one I work at doesn't seem to be affected. And I said, oh, what video store do you work at? She said, well, it's a, a triple X. It's a porn, <laughs> it's a porn thing. And, and I was like, really? She said, oh, yeah. You know, you know it's, a, it's an industry. We have our own magazines. I said, really? There are trade magazines and pornography? She says, I'll bring in some. And she showed me these magazines where basically, you know, it's kind of like exhibitors take note. This 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 film was held over, you know, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of boobs. Well, stuff. forget about writing a book. You should try and become a uh, uh, a triple X movie. A triple X movie. Crit critic, critic. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the thing was that it was so. There's well, got to be worse jobs. Oh yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing about about this whole business that she brought up was that uh, you know she was talking about there were conventions, and uh, she met Malcolm McDowell. 
uh, at one of those conventions because Calig Caligula is one of the movies that he was in Clockwork Orange. And he was in Clockwork Orange, yeah. yeah. But but Caligula was apparently one of the you know one of the movies that you know the convention goers wanted to see. The uncut version? Yeah, well probably. Yeah. Yeah, no, when I first saw that uh, I was shocked. Shocked in the pool, Buffalo. Shocked in the pool. <laughs> Well, I hope you do write that book because uh, it, you, you obviously know a heck of a lot about film, the nuances are involved in it, and the creation process. Uh, I know you're coming back for our the Department of Education podcast right. soon, but uh, when the book comes out, I'd like to have it come back and we'll talk about that. Okay. And yeah. you sit here with the book, you know, like the Johnny Carson, so you sit right. here with, right. the, sure. with the book up, you know. <laughs> But anyway, I appreciate your time tonight, you. uh, Mr. Pucci, and uh, and we'll see you very soon. Okay. And enjoy your retirement, my friend. I'll try. And God bless you. Thank you.